Okay, I'm going to continue section 2.4 from Triola's book here, talking about dot plots. So one of the first things that I would like to talk about with a dot plot is the fact that a dot plot isn't very good at showing us shapes. So I'm going to put a star on here, and I'm going to underline the fact that it's the shape that I'm talking about, and the shape can be hard to see from a dot plot. However, a dot plot is very good about keeping the original data, just like a stem and leaf, it's ordered data, just like a stem and leaf, and in some respects it's even better than a stem and leaf or than the histogram about showing us outliers. So although it does have its drawbacks, it also has its benefits here, and its benefit may be that it's even better than some of our other methods of showing these outliers. So for our, our dot plots, what we are doing is on a number line, we're pretty much just giving you a dot for each data point. So I've drawn my number line here, um, numbered off by fives, and I'm going to draw in a very nice horizontal line here the first data points that I see. So my first one is at 16, so I'm going to draw a dot here at 16. And then my next one is at 17, so I'm going to draw a little dot here at 17. And I want to make sure that this stays on a nice horizontal. Now my next dot will be at 21, and then the next one will be at 29. I have a really hard time sometimes getting dots to draw on this thing. And then my next one is, oops, that wasn't 29, that was 24. Um, 29, not 24. So let me go ahead and draw 29 in here. And then my next two are at 30 and 30. I do have to draw two points like that. So here's my first one at 30, right? Nice horizontal line here. But now my second one, I'm going to stack that second one right on top here. And that's what starts showing the shape with a dot plot, too, is that you get build up here. Now the next one is at 39. So I have the two 30s and then the 39. So 39 is here. And notice that the 39 is going on the nice horizontal with the rest of these. And then my next one's at 41. So 41 here. And then my next point is at 50. And so you see that there's not much for shape here. Unlike with my stem and leaf and my histogram both, I'm not seeing this nice shape. It's just kind of a string of data here. And that's what makes the dot plot not as good as the histogram or the stem and leaf plot. Um, one thing, though, that we really do notice here with the um, dot plot is that we do notice that there's more of a grouping of data down here and these are kind of grouped to themselves up here, with this 50 being quite a long ways here from the rest of the data. And so that's what I mean by you can start to see even more about the outliers. So you see the, stem, uh, the dot plots, in some respects, even easier than a stem and leaf plot because you don't have to understand expanded notation. Um, but this shape is a big deal. We want to see the distribution. And this you can see right here, just doesn't really do it for us. Now there's another type of, um, of graph that I want to talk about before we um, go too much further, and that's just our pie chart. And a pie chart, um, really you can think of a pie chart as just being a relative frequency um, type of representation. So remember that anytime you have the circle, it's going to represent one whole. And then the pie pieces in this circle are going to represent percent of the whole. And that's all that a pie chart is going to represent. And I'm not going to draw a pie chart because more typically what you're going to see is a pie chart is a representation of um, categorical data rather than um, quantitative data. So categorical or um, categorical or um, qualitative data, not qua the quantitative numeric data like our purse snatcher is. Now the other thing that we do is that once we get the percent of the whole, then we say, okay, well this was 30%, right? So this represents 30% of our whole, and then we can say, okay, 0.3 
and then there are 360 degrees in a circle, and so we have R0 and then the 8 time and carry the 1 and 9 plus 1, which is 10, and then we use the decimal. And so this 30% would have to be represented by 108 degrees. So you could start from the middle of the circle, right, and using a protractor, and then you could measure out that at 108 degrees. We know that this would be about 90, and then you use your protractor and you could measure exactly so that this represented 108 degrees, which would then be representative of 30% of your circle. And that is how you put together a pie chart. So remember that when we read them that it's 30% of the whole, and the whole that we're talking about then has something to do with n. So you remember when in chapter one where we talked about doing percentage problems, this was why we started talking about percentage problems. Because pie charts we need to be able to say, oh, if it says it's 30% of this, then 30% of what? Well, the sample size, 30% of the sample size equals the actual counts within there. And that's what we're looking at for our pie charts. So also in the statistical graph area, you are going to see about pie charts. Now something else that you're going to see in this section, again, that I don't discuss um, in any great detail, is something called a Pareto chart. And a Pareto chart is basically, again, for categorical data. So we use pie charts and Pareto's a lot of times for categorical data. And it's basically um, a line, it's usually a line graph or a bar chart um, that's drawn on its side this way. Um, now, it can be drawn either way, but it's more likely to be seen this way. Um, However, the one that uh, Triola does have on page 63 is a vertical one. Now this is again a lot of times for categorical data and the way that they're always drawn is that your largest quantity is down at the bottom or to the left um, and then it goes in smaller and smaller quantities. And the purpose of a Pareto chart is to show where you have your most and then less and less and less and it shows the stair steps as well as which ones are the greatest and remember again these are usually done with categorical data they're not often done with our um, quantitative data because we don't want to see the quantitative data necessarily in this highest class down on down to the lowest class um, counts. We want to see different things from ca uh, quantitative data. Now, uh, the last thing that's in this section that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about um, a scatter plot. So, a scatter plot, you should all be familiar with scatter plots just as the plotting of um, ordered pairs. So, this is really a plot of ordered pair data. And we have to remember that we have independent and dependent data in ordered pairs. And the x's represent, represent the independents and the y's represent dependents. So x represents independent data and the y's represent dependent data. So we have one thing that depends upon another thing. So one of the types of data that we data that might be of this form would be um, maybe let's see the number of chirps of a cricket and the temperature of the atmosphere. And this is a dependent relationship. And we'll probably talk about this data. Um, it's very old data and it's brought up in a lot of different um, contexts. But the number of chirps that are um, put out by a certain type of cricket um, can be an indicator of the temperature 
or vice versa. So we could say that the number of chirps of the cricket is dependent upon the temperature of the atmosphere. And so that could be um, something that's dependent and independent data. So let's just briefly talk again about how we do um, scatter plots. We have our independent axis as the horizontal one here and our dependent axis as our vertical one here. We have the zero point typically given here as an origin. Now a lot of times with our scatter plots uh, we will have just positive um, independence and positive dependence. So all we really need is just what we call the first quadrant. And then we're going to put in a point it represents something on the x-axis and something on the y-axis and we label those with ordered pairs x comma y's and we have a set of data and we'll put in all the ordered pairs that represent this data labeling all of them of course and that creates what we would call a scatter plot and with scatter plots we'll have some units down here for our depend independence and usually some units up here for our dependence as well and just um, kind of in the similar vein there that we talk about when we do any of our graphs just label things and this we're going to use later on when we come to regression and um, and the correlation of data. And we'll be looking at these scatter plots to see if we have some visual representation of correlation. And then we can proceed to finding out if it's mathematical correlation. And then we can proceed on to finding a regression equation. So those are just some different types of graphs that we have. And that's where I'm going to wrap up this lecture.